Hello, hello! We are now looking at my top five anime of 2020, starting with this show, Deca Dents. This is a bizarre show, a really, truly bizarre show. And it isn't just weirdness for the sake of weirdness, where everything is like so wacky and weird and different, um, but a weirdness that permeates every aspect of the plot, of the characterization, of the world building, of the aesthetic, of the way it's animated, of the way everything else is produced. All of it is just a little off. Um, all of it stemming from just the, the truly bizarre twist that emerges in episode two. The basic structure is kind of neo-formulaic. Um, once you see episode one, you're kind of like, okay, I get it. It it's kind of fits into a, a fairly popular modern genre, which I would call like tower defense, <laughs> high action tower defense genre. <laughs> I'm sure from that alone you can think of some popular examples. But no, it is not just another one of those. No, 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 no. You really can't even begin to guess what this twist is. I, I don't want to say too much, just that it was a, a truly shocking experience. Um, one that I typically don't have in anime. One, you know, I've watched a lot of anime. I typically see things coming. <laughs> but this show uh, completely swept the rug out from underneath me. But despite all of these twists and, and the bizarre sense of alienation you get as you uh, start to unpuzzle how this world operates... The significance of absolutely everything that happens is really clear, and, and I think that's key to shows like this, key to, to kind of bizarre and mysterious shows. And, and this is a, a rule I've cited before, that things should make you go, wow. They shouldn't make you go, huh? Um, that, that even if you, you can't understand the full ramifications of everything, how it fits into the, the lore, how um, it reflects um, deeper world building and stuff, um, the impact of it should still really hit. You should still understand how much it matters to the characters, even if you don't know why it matters to the characters. Um, and, and, and I like to summarize this by thinking that every twist, every surprise should be wow, and, and not huh. <laughs> um, and, and physically, too, the, the, the sheer physical impact. Uh, although this is a really super weird show aesthetically, the fight scenes are really gripping and, and pretty well made for um, a studio that I, I haven't really associated with, like high-level Sakuga. Um, they put a lot of work into it to, uh, to make the fight scenes something special. And again, um, just a very weird, unique style of fighting, um, both on the, the macro and micro scales. Uh, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's just uh, kind of gross and unnerving at times, but um, really compelling and unique. And it, it hits your heart, too, uh, that, I, that by the end, I, I was really touched by the struggles of these characters, that I, I really was rooting for them from deep within my heart. Um, I, I never thought I would be emotionally attached to something that was so weird. Just kidding. <laughs> nah, I was fully, fully aware of, of how capable I was of loving something this weird. This is probably not even in the top 50 weirdest things that I've, I've kind of fallen in love with conceptually, but... It's, it's still a very lovely feeling to, to have a show with such a bizarre premise, such a bizarre world, um, to feel so alienated and distant from a lot of the things that are happening, and still find yourself moved, still seeing your empathy react to these characters uh, is, is really proof of something very special happening within yourself and within the show. So, great. I loved it. I hope they keep making weirdo shows like that. Here's another fantastic show. The Great Pretender. After five years since the release of Rolling Girls, Wit Studio finally does something else that interests me. <laughs> uh, since then, they've been making mostly gray and brown gritty action shows. But they, they remembered that colors exist. Wow. <laughs> Um, I was so excited to hear this show is coming out. I was so excited to hear that Wit had dropped Attack on Titan and was doing other stuff. Uh, I, I think they have such amazing potential as a studio that their action scenes are among the best in the entire industry. 
and, and I was so thrilled that they were working on projects that actually interested me again. Um, I, they did actually have this one show called After the Rain. I didn't watch that. I think it's very melodramatic. Um, and then the plot didn't like hook me when I heard the synopsis or whatever. Um, but I heard it was quite good. So that, that was that. There was actually another project they had in the meantime since Rolling Girls that I think I might have liked, but. I don't know, I just didn't watch it. Anyways, uh, this is an explosively beautiful and curling crime, crime caper type of series across a dizzying array of genres and locales. The two core format, it's a 24 episode show, allows for real cinematic length arcs um, that they can really dive into and build up a unique cast for each arc, build up the setting, kind of have a an aesthetic that's all its own, um, a, a series of locations that end up feeling familiar and comfy, um, and then to also just stuff in the twists, layers and layers and layers of twist after twist after twist. Um, because across a variety of different scams, different cons, the, the main characters being con men who travel the globe to, to make their riches, the consistent factor, and this was a big meme in our watching group, in on it, oh, that guy's in on it too. No way. They were all in on it. Oh, but they anticipated that because that guy was in on it too. Oh, it just never stops being fun. Um, just, just, I don't know. Like if, if it's well written, if it's genuinely surprising, if it, if it feels cool, like if you feel kind of awed, um, by, by just how smooth the characters operate, uh, even, even the, the most, um, you know, kind of standard progression of these sorts of plots is is overwhelmingly hype. It's so satisfying. It's so much fun to, to just realize, oh, they were in on it the whole time? Hey, kitty, are you in on it too? It's unclear whether or not he's in on it. The climaxes of each arc are each so different. Um, I, I'm really impressed with how, you know, sometimes it's uh, the awaiting the results of some competition. Sometimes it's, it's an auction. I don't want to get too much into it. I don't want to spoil it. Um, but they, they manage to build each arc in such a vastly different direction. Yet each is still just such a perfect accumulation of all the tension before it. That all of them are written in this wonderful way that the, that final climactic scene carries the weight of everything that came before it. And, and that's not easy to do. To have all of these twists and all of these characters. Hey, kitty. Do you want up? He was kind of climbing up, so I thought maybe he wants up. You want to talk about anime with me? You can't really see him very well, but he's on my lap now. Anyways. Yeah, to, to be able to have all of those little threads that you, you set up before weave together into this one climactic finale sequence is, is just really phenomenal and, and so hype, so exciting. The writing uh, kind of reminds me of the Safdie bros um, who made movies like Good Time and Uncut Gems, just masterpieces of tension and accumulation and that same sort of thing of every little plot thread weaves together into one mega climax, um, but so much more fun. <laughs> they just... Uh, there's such a spirit of, of camaraderie and discovery and um, seeking your, your fortune and reputation and place in the world that um, even for all of its tension, I, I can't imagine not having fun watching this series. At the core, though, is still just good characterization that none of this stuff would be anywhere near as meaningful or compelling if you didn't truly care about the characters if they didn't truly feel like like real people that had their own motivations their own secrets their own connections that you you want to see through to the end everyone is great but the main character edamame <laughs> i've become such a huge fan of uh the thrill of encountering a type of character that you hadn't really i haven't really seen much before of the edamame edamame archetype um and then realizing how much uh, he really is my type. <laughs> Realizing like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, I'm into this, um, is, is really thrilling and, and, you know, not the most common feeling of, uh, you know, if, if I see a, a studious stoic character who probably wears glasses um, and is really, really good at some fairly obscure skill, 
uh, and, and has a hard time connecting emotionally to others. I'm not surprised that I'm like, oh, I'm into this. Oh, can't wait to see more of this character. Um, but Edamame is like totally outside kind of my normal, oh, see ya. My normal like wheelhouse of characters that uh, intrigue me, and and yet I was I was blown away <laughs> by by how much I liked him. Okay, anyways, next we have this lovely series, Gal and Dinosaur. Uh, this is another one by the bizarre studio Kamikaze Doga, and uh, I think this is gonna go down as like another classic on the tier of pop team epic. Maybe it won't have the same broad appeal as Pop Team Epic. It's not so, <clears throat> excuse me, like explicitly weird and mimetic. But I think to those who know, Gal and Dinosaur is going to have a, a a special place in their heart for a long time. Um, it, 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 it still has a lot of the, the structure that we really appreciated in Pop Team Epic. The vast variety of skits, the, the guest animators little games within the series, um, you know, trying to spot Dino uh, in the time limit, running gags that pop up in all sorts of different forms and across all sorts of different mediums. Um, but rather than the, the double VA gimmick, the, the famous double airing of Pop Team Epic, where after the first half of the show, they would rerun the second half of the show, but with different voice acting, and sometimes a couple other minor modifications. Here, the second half is mostly in live action, um, but in, in true Kamikaze Doga tradition, the live action segments are totally insane too, with, with guest stars, some major Japanese celebrities showing up for no reason, uh, bizarre subsections, just total wildness, and, and time travel conspiracy plots. Of course. <laughs> The creative freedom, I would say, in the show goes even further than Pop Team Epic, which is saying a lot and might be an, a controversial statement. They, they go hard in different directions, um, but I, I would say, you know, the, the sort of experiments they were doing here um, go there, which makes sense because they wanted to go even further than Pop Team Epic, I think. They're even more creative. The sheer joy I felt in seeing some of these experiments in animation, just the spotlight that they shone on these probably quite small, unique creators. The fun that everyone involved was so obviously having at all stages of production. Just the attitude of this series um, as, as for, of Gal and Dinosaur is just as suited as Pop Team Epic for irreverent fun, but it's really different too. Um, whereas Pop Team Epic is kind of weirdly cynical and satirical and, and oftentimes very like rude, uh, offensive, aggressive. Um, here, things are still quite weird, but a very wholesome world unfolds around uh, the Gyaru who took in a dinosaur one day when she was drinking. And the actual chorus story that, that we, we said there, the gal and her dinosaur is so lovely, so cozy, just perfect slice of life bliss captures all the wonderful strengths of, of any of these other getting-to-know-you type series, a, an odd couple type relationship where suddenly someone is readjusting their lifestyle to accommodate someone new and, and learning just how wonderful that can be. Uh, they, they better keep adopting manga like this. Kamikaze Doga, I, I want to see them year after year uh, just picking niche cult classic type manga that, that have the potential to explode into this many faceted, faceted rainbow-colored experiment fest of, of animation styles and, and mediums and guests. And I, I, I think there's so many manga that are so well-suited for this kind of adaptation. My recommendations, um, the series Kanako's Life as an Assassin, uh, I think would be really well-suited for this kind of a, a adaptation. It's by the mangaka who did um, you know, that romance series everybody likes. It, all, it got an animated adaptation a bit ago. Anyways, it's a, a fairly well-known one. Uh, Mado Romichan, um, who's uh, the, the mangaka that did um, uh, the And So the Wolf-Like Boy Tells Another Lie Today, or whatever that series is called, which is also fantastic. But Mado Romichan is like a, a Yatsuba kind of style 
father raising a child type series um but it's like really goofy and has some really weird elements to it and i think it would be fantastic as kind of this explode in all directions type of adaptation and then probably the one i want to see most usagi moku about these two rabbits that worked on like a black company on the moon that got sent down to earth um and then slave away for some random guy in an attempt to kind of reestablish their working identities uh again really goofy <laughs> really weird it has so many bizarre parodies and scenarios i think it would just be perfect as a kamikaze a kamikaze doga adaptation so if anybody at the studio is watching this start bidding on these properties i, I think they'd all make fantastic shows okay next we have this lovely shot of the universe at night. We are talking, of course, about the Koisuru asteroid. This is cute girls looking at very, very, very old things. Digging up ancient rocks or staring at incomprehensibly ancienter stars. And this is another Dogokobo adaptation, very similar to uh, the Dogokobo fishing show that was number 10 on our list. This is, if you're keeping track, the third Dogokobo show of our 2020 list. They're, they're kind of just killing it right now. It's fun, it's lively, it's warm, relaxing, and educational. So, so why is this one number two on the list and the other one was number 10 on the list? What is so special about Koisuru Asteroid? Uh, there's just this level of serenity that this hits that few other shows really achieve. Um, something really kind of magical happens in this kind of healing genre. Uh, when it when it reaches a certain threshold of quality for me, and, and this is uh, one of the rare shows that really moved me on that level. We start to tap into the feelings of the self-excluding paradise. This is a term I have mentioned time and time again on these videos, and I keep promising to explain it, but I, I never do. And this will be no exception. Um, basically, the, the idea, in, in extreme summary, is that uh, you perceive a world where you acutely don't exist so much so that you forget who it is that doesn't exist. That there is such an absence of all the things that cause you anxiety in life. It's not even that you forget, but that you believe in the possibility of the absence of those anxieties. And you feel the absence of those anxieties when you're immersed in the show. Because it is so opposite. Not that the show is all about stress-free stuff, of course. Um, anyways, but um, just the way they, they look at these stars, so unchanging. The fixed sphere. They look at these rocks that have gone undisturbed. Since before human beings trod upon the earth and, and blending those, those feelings of eternalness and serenity into the contentment they have, just spending time with friends, exploring these spaces, learning about them, sharing that passion together, it creates a sublime peace. But, as I said, this show isn't healing to this extent because it's like not about big changes and, and growth and, and dealing with difficult things, um, there's a huge emphasis on, on the characters as they change and grow throughout the series. Um, and here, uh, Kuro, who is the original author of the manga that this is adapted from, um, was originally a doujinshi artist who made Hidamari sketch doujins and made really, really good Hidamari sketch doujins. Um, some of my favorites that I read like way before they were a mangaka. By the way, you know how beautiful it is? You know how wonderful it feels to read someone's self-published doujinshi? That's a, a redundant, but you know what it like. <laughs> in case you didn't know, uh, doujinshi are totally self-published. They're just fan works. They're just sold at conventions um, and kind of traded around and, and sold in um, niche comic shops and stuff. As far from mainstream as you can get. To follow an artist from that to getting like a big budget TV adaptation of their manga feels 
amazing. It's so cool. Like, I feel so blessed to have these sorts of opportunities to see an artist grow to that extent and to see those opportunities open up for them. It's amazing. It just feels so wonderful. Anyways, um, so yeah, I read these Hidamari sketch dojins and I was like, wow, this person really understands the characters and they really understand some of the more um, subtle but important parts of Hidamari sketch, which is like stuff like the, the characters really growing throughout the series and time actually progressing and, you know, um, some of the more famous moments in Hidamari sketches as characters graduating and leaving and other characters being introduced and stuff. Um, and in Koisuru Asteroid, too, we have the same things. Big decisions. Big changes. Characters going through major phases of their lives. It's amazing. Uh, the passage of time cannot be ignored. Even though we are so focused on the eternal, connections and relationships will ebb and flow. Big questions and, and even things that approach drama. Like, <laughs> um, you know, trying to, to figure out what they're going to do, trying to, to get out of situations where it seems like there's no win, um, unfold behind the big, big feelings. Uh, and, and Slice of Life stuff, it doesn't need to aim for this sort of impact, like the, the fishing show does not have any aspirations to tell these sorts of grand stories of people's lives. But when it succeeds, when it doesn't feel melodramatic, but instead really feels like a slice of someone's life, it's just so lovely. It's it's not actually that dissimilar to the feeling I have watching uh, Kuro grow as an artist, uh, watching the characters grow on screen. It's that same mixture of pride and sentimentality and and kind of a melancholy feeling, too, of, of just like, ah, time marches forward, things change, nothing remains. All right. Next we have Keep Your Hands Off Aizou Ken. Um, for people that have heard me talk about this show before, this is absolutely no surprise that it is at number one. Oh my god, what, the, what a masterpiece. Where do I even begin with this? Um, some of my absolute favorite things in anime. A story about creative fulfillment through hard work. Production where reality blends into animation, as I was talking about before, the, the diagram space. No show has ever taken that as far as this one. Stories of weirdos who help each other out. Settings with lots of niche communities and clubs and such. They're, they're, the high school setting here is like fantastic. You see all these different quirky little clubs situated in this crazy labyrinthian school it just excites the animation to a, a, a fiery level um and stories where you learn the the logistics behind oblique industries what, what does it take to make a fan animation what are all the equipment you need what how do you promote yourself how do you motivate yourself how does the team function who who handles what all of this stuff is explained in in not excruciating detail but in a way that's like really compelling um, and really uh, educational. It, it really feels like a show just built for me. Like, <laughs> the, the amount of things in this show that are, like, just checking off the boxes of, of all of my favorite things in anime is, is kind of mind-blowing. It's kind of surreal. I, I really could not ask, have asked for anything more in a show's premise. But even if I had asked for such a show, even if I had the, the guts to just present this list, here is my ideal anime... I'd never have dreamed that it could be this good. Just the, the production level is off the charts. Uh, Yuasa, working with his studio, Science Saru, um, they're just unique vision. The way, the way they see the world, the way that they're able to depict things has perhaps been never stronger, especially because so much of the show blurs between uh, the, the physical, real depiction of reality, which is already explosively creative and quirky and weird and then everything flowing through the minds of the characters um, suddenly appearing on screen it, it just feels totally unrestrained uh yeah i'm excited too um just just uh it, it i i don't know if it's ever been stronger and yet it's it's strong in a completely different direction than any of his other projects like you know, Ping Pong is attempting to have that same, uh, like, emotions 
overflowing into reality. Same with Devil Man Crybaby, and they're huge successes in this regard. And yet both of them are so totally different than this, so totally different from each other. It's amazing. It's so amazing. I I <laughs> I cannot stop raving about how good this show is. Even things like the soundtrack. It has such a good soundtrack on top of everything. Some of the songs that play when they start kind of getting into their 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 flow state, when you really start seeing the creative juices flowing, it, it's just it gives me like such a deep feeling of of engagement and satisfaction. And the sound effects, the sound effects are like a, a major theme of this show, that they discuss what goes into making a good sound effect and how to properly um, enhance animation through sound effects. So very fittingly, the show itself has fantastic sound effects. Uh, it's 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 so good. My my biggest regret is that I I have to wait until twenty thirty uh, to put it on my my top twenty anime of the decade list, so I can praise it even higher. Because I'll be shocked if it does not make that list. Oh my god, I just I just love this show. My number one for twenty twenty. That is the list. We're gonna do albums next. The album list is almost done. Hey, Katie. Um, these are, of course, very late at this point, but <sighs> I don't know. My motivation for working on things like this is uh, much more waning than waxing these days. Um, is, is often very unsteady. Uh, so I'm just happy that I, I had a little period where I was uh, eager to work on it. And I finished it, and hopefully we'll get some other uh, such lists and stuff done. So hopefully you'll check out some of these shows, maybe you've already seen them. Um, let me know, is there things I missed that, based on this, you would think I liked? Um, is there things that you checked out because of this? What did you think of them? I don't know. All that standard uh, engagement driving stuff, but I really am very curious. Alright, that's all for now. Bye-bye.